it's really for uh, somebody that has, you know, a pretty good concept of social media is understands the basics of Pinterest and, you know, its functions and the way, you know, how to pin something, how to create a board, that type of thing, but really wants to develop a good strategy for using their account. You are listening to educationhackers.com. Podcasting from Vancouver, Canada, Education Hackers highlights successful entrepreneurs with great online courses. And now to introduce today's guest is e-learning evangelist, Steve Atwal. Today, I'm very happy to have Cynthia Sanchez on the show. Cynthia is the CEO and founder of Oh So Pinteresting. She and her team work with businesses to create and implement Pinterest and social media solutions. Her clients range from small businesses to a Fortune 100 corporation. She is an international speaker, writer, and podcaster. She has been featured by Social Media Examiner, The Huffington Post, and Entrepreneur as a leading Pinterest expert. Cynthia, you've been told a few times that you should be cloned. Tell us why people say that to you. Oh, I think it's only one person that says that. Ralph Rivera, um, just a great guy. You know, he, he does the Web Search Social podcast with his wife, Carolyn, and they're just great friends. Um, but for some reason, he just thinks that, I, you know, I, I just do some amazing things. But I think I'm just, you know, your average ordinary person just trying to get through the day. Well, that's got to be appreciated. It is. It is very nice of him to say that. <laughs> Before we get into your online training and course, I always like to know how my guests unwind and relax from all the hard work they are doing. Taking time out is so important in recharging and letting those brain cells recover a little bit. How do you relax and unwind? Yeah, uh, well, it depends uh, when I when it's just like one of those day to days and everything kind of finally winds down at the end of day. It's a it's a nice glass of wine and a conversation with my husband about anything but work. <laughs> you know, we both just need to step away from a little while and and, and talk about other things. Um, we did just recently move to a new part of the country. We live in, in Charleston, South Carolina now after living in Texas for 18 years. So to really get away and to, to kind of clear the cobwebs or all the mess that's in our heads, actually, we like to explore and we like to travel. And, and right now we're really enjoying um, getting to know our new area and to meet new people and to explore all the history that's around here. So did you leave your gun behind in Texas? <laughs> I never had one, <laughs> but most of my neighbors did. <laughs> it's funny. I've had a few people on the show that uh, I always kid them because they live in Texas and I always ask them if they have a gun. And most of the time they say they do. So it's interesting. Yeah, most people do. Uh, my husband and my kids would go to the shooting range and they all learned how to shoot. My husband was in the military before, so um, he knew how to and, you know, he taught the kids how to. I just. I just never did it. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I think it's something I'll do someday. Uh, if I find target practice and, you know, that kind of thing interesting. But having one in my home is, is I'm, I'm not too sure about. <laughs> Try taking up archery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a little bit harder to hurt yourself or other people with, with a bow and arrow. <laughs> You have to try. <laughs> <laughs> Just so everyone has a basis for this discussion, tell us what Pinterest is in a nutshell and why should businesses be using it? Sure. Uh, Pinterest is an online visual bookmarking system. Um, it's not your typical social network where you go and have a conversation with someone. It is more for organizing and keeping up with the things that you find online that are interesting to you. And the images on Pinterest are called pins. And most of those images, unless you you upload an image from your computer to your Pinterest account, um, they all link to somewhere online. They link back to their original source most of the time, unless somebody steals your pins. Um, and you can find information about that product, about that project, read that article, whatever it happens to link to online. And that's why businesses should be interested in Pinterest for the traffic generation they can get out of it. Uh, we all know as business owners, the more people we can get to see and hear about what we have to offer, the more chances we have to convert into sales. Um, so traffic generation, brand awareness, those are really the, the two big reasons that businesses should be interested in Pinterest. And what was your passion before you created the online training called Oh So Pinteresting? Um, well, I, I had my blog and, and my business about Pinterest for about, oh my goodness, a year and a half before I launched my course. So it was really learning how to do that, building up the blog, building up the business before I launched the course. And prior to that, my background is in nursing. Um, my last actual nine to five job was as a radiation oncology nurse. So it was, it was a bit of a change. Yeah, that is a bit of a change. Uh, <laughs> how did you 
you get into Pinterest, and why did you specialize in Pinterest instead of, say, for example, Instagram? I asked this question because I recently interviewed Sue B. Zimmerman,、mm-hmm. the Instagram gal. It seems that Pinterest has some similarities with Instagram in that they are both very visual, but they also have some differences. Tell us why you decided to specialize in Pinterest. Sure.、Um, well, as I mentioned, I was working full time, and at that time, I thought I would eventually start an online business in in the field of on. Oncology somewhere,、um, but I didn't know how to do that. So I thought I would do something for fun at the beginning. And at that time, Pinterest had taken over my world,、um, and nothing had done that for me online before. And you know, my family and I are, are pretty techy, geeky people, and have been on the internet since you know 1993, I think. And、um, You know, it just had a big impact on me. It's like, well, let, let's figure out how to blog and how to do all this kind of tech stuff、uh, with Pinterest first, and just just you know talk about the things I was doing, what I was finding, what it was you know, and how it was influencing my life, I suppose. And I did that for a few months. Went to、uh, Blog World, the last Blog World they had in New York City. Printed up some business cards just in hopes of you know getting a few more readers to the blog and, and to learn a lot about you know building a blog as a business. And you know, so I had those business cards. A local Business owner found one of my cards when I returned home to Texas, and asked me to help them with their Pinterest account. And we had to have quite a few long conversations explaining that this that wasn't what I do. You know, I wasn't a marketer. I wasn't you know a business person. I was a nurse, and just doing this you know for this reason. And they hadn't been in their line of business in their you know lifetime careers. These were this was a couple、um, I guess in their early sixties, and they were starting you know another chapter in their life with a new business. And we decided to go it together. So at that moment, I turned my entire focus of every waking moment that I had to learn about social media marketing, and I really thought that Pinterest、um, was different from other social networks in how it affected my life. I was a product of that. It influenced what I bought, what I read, the things my family ate. It had a huge influence on my life, and saw how it exposed me to new blogs, new businesses, and you know even new things to buy. So I really did see its potential in helping. A small business or any business grow.、Um, so I, I studied and learned and took courses and talked to everybody I could about social media marketing, and they were my first client. And then I figured, well, if they, I can have one client, I could probably have more. And that's how the business started. And then I wanted to to grow that and and offer training. And then that's when the course came in. You have some interesting quotes on your website from Rich Relevance, a study that they did back in 2012. Some of those、uh, some of those quotes are Pinterest drives more referral traffic than Google Plus, LinkedIn, and YouTube combined.、Mm-hmm. Pinterest shoppers, on average, spend nearly one hundred seventy dollars per session. In comparison, Facebook shoppers spend ninety five dollars per session, while Twitter shoppers spend seventy dollars per session.、Mm-hmm. Now these are from twenty twelve, and this is three years later now. Do you think those stats are still the same, or have they changed? Have they increased? You know, I haven't seen any recent stats. That really break it down to dollar amounts or or the traffic、uh, referral numbers like that.、Um, everybody was you know really interested in Pinterest back in 2012 because that's when it really really took off. So I haven't seen any studies to update those you know those. Those numbers there, I've been on the lookout for them, but I, I can see why those were true back then, and I can see that those would probably still be true now because of the way Pinterest is built、uh, and the way people use Pinterest. People use. It for their own interest to find out what they're interested in, to discover new things, to buy new things, and that all leads to sales and traffic.、Uh, when you're on Facebook, for example, you're there to to see what your you know your family's up to, what your friends are up to, what's going on you know in your community. Not necessarily there to explore what. You like to do, not your hobbies, not your interests, not you know your you know the latest you know thing you're going to buy.、Um, so the way people use it is different. And as I mentioned before, all of the images or most of the images are links to other places online. So that traffic number, it's just it's just a given. Let's talk about your online coaching and training called Oh So Pinteresting. That's a nice name, by the way. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Give us a bird's eye view of the training. What do you cover? Who's it for? And why should people be signing up for? 
it? Sure. Um, it is uh, has been more of a workshop based training where it is a live event that happens online over three weeks, and it's a very small group, so it's it's really intimate. Um, I really appreciate and enjoy myself being able to ask questions when I have questions when I'm learning something new. Not have to, not to have to, you know, maybe call somebody or wait for a response, you know, because I'm in the middle of doing things. I want to get it done. So that's how I offered my training initially. And it's really for uh, somebody that has, you know, a pretty good concept of social media is understands the basics of Pinterest, of Pinterest and, you know, its functions and the way, you know, how to pin something, how to create a board, that type of thing, but really wants to develop a good strategy for using their account, for, you know, evolving their account, how to learn, how to create images that are really attractive on Pinterest. Um, you know, so it's not really for the newbie, but it's not for the super advanced person that's, you know, been on Pinterest for, you know, a, a long time and, and wants to do more with that. For that, I offer more private coaching and training. So what do you use to create images for Pinterest? Uh, my two favorite tools are Canva and PicMonkey. Um, they're just so super easy to use. I, I have Photoshop. I can stumble around Photoshop, but those other two online tools are free. Um, they're, they're super user friendly. Uh, you know, I can do most everything I need there every now and then I will have to take an image into Photoshop, but not too often. Um, there's a million and one, it seems like lately, free sources of, of copyright free, you know, royalty free images that you can get out there and create into some really pinnable images. Yeah, it's interesting. I see a lot of infographics. So infographics seem to be very popular on how to do something. Mm -hmm. Are those um, something that you can create easily using Canva and uh, PicMonkey? Oh, definitely. You know, PicMonkey has a collage feature that I really, really like. And you can decide how many cells or, or spaces that it has, um, the width, the height, that type of thing. Um, so what I like to do is to create images multiple images that are the same size and have those saved as separate files and then bring them into PicMonkey individually into a collage and then just stack them on top of each other. And there you have an infographic style image. I just recently had a woman on my podcast who works for a company and she did this for one of their projects and has been testing it. She's really into data and to numbers and she loves to look at analytics. So she made several variations of the same infographic style image where it was um, more of a, a project like you mentioned, and she just put the steps one on top of the other. She tested color. She tested adding text. And she figured out which one really resonated the best and which one drove the most traffic. But in taking that approach, um, in less than a year of taking Pinterest seriously and doing these tests with their images, and they don't do these with every image, um, they brought over a million and a half visitors to their website in less than a year. Wow, that's amazing. So do these tools tie into Pinterest as well? Can you post from them? Uh, you can but I wouldn't recommend doing that um, because if you post from them, then the link will go back to them. And as a business owner, I want the links to come back to my website, to my blog, uh, so people can read my content or, or see the products or services I have to offer there. Um, so I recommend downloading them to your hard drive and then, you know, putting them somewhere on your website and then pinning them from there. Great advice. So you offer different packages for your Pinterest training and you help individuals as well as businesses. I saw one package on the Oh So Pinteresting website, which includes included one-on-one Skype or telephone conference, custom HD screen cast walkthrough, plus a printable PDF report of recommendations for your site and Pinterest account, a Skype or telephone conference to review recommendations and implementation strategies, follow up 30 minute phone or Skype conference, email support. Is this a typical package that you offer with your training? Uh, yeah, that is like my most in-depth package that I offer. That's for somebody that really wants help with really understanding and learning Pinterest specific to their business, where my other training and my other offerings are more, you know, more of a group type of situation. This really gets down to your specific business. So this is more the advanced, not necessarily for the advanced user, but more the advanced, more in-depth um, type of, of service that I offer. Um, I look at Pinterest and other social networks at the content that you produce at the website, you know, how it's functioning, how it would work with people coming from Pinterest. Is it mobile responsive? Um, um, how to tweak your content to be more appealing to the Pinterest community and how we can integrate it and maybe cross promote that with other social networks. Um, it's it's more of an in-depth 
personalized process. So in terms of Pinterest, and I'm looking at Pinterest, I use Pinterest, but I haven't really made full use of it. Do you have to be a bit of a designer in order to create images for Pinterest? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, my background is in nursing, not in design, and all of my most of my traffic comes well. My most refer referral site for for traffic is Pinterest. But really, tools like Canva make it so super simple. They give you layouts that are designed by professional graphic designers that you can go just and you know add your text to or change out the color to match your your branding. Um, it, there's so many tools out there that make it easy just to do that. And then you can always use Pinterest for inspiration. Um, my business isn't necessarily a visually based business. Um, I, there's only so many screenshots of Pinterest that I can show before it gets really, really boring. Um, so there's a lot of times I'll just go to Pinterest and kind of see what layouts or what color combinations or what shapes catch my eye. And then, you know, think about ways that I can co incorporate that into the message I'm trying to communicate. Sometimes I see a lot of these images with quotes on them. Mm -hmm. How do you recommend people get some of those quotes and then put them on your images so you can post them? Them because they seem to be very um, appealing to people. Yeah, quotes are very popular, motivational or inspirational or, or little bits of tips or advice. Um, so it really depends on what kind of quote you would like to make. Um, there's been times when I've pulled quotes out of my podcast episodes, you know, something a guest had said or, or something like that, or something from a podcast I was listening to or a speech I was listening to and have made those into quotes. So they can come from lots of different sources. There's a, a site called Brainy Quote. I think it's brainyquote.com and it has all all sorts of quotes. It's a huge database of, of quotes. So you can search the kind that you're looking for. Um, and then, of course, you know, credit the person that said it. And you can go into tools like PicMonkey or Canva and just add the text and create them there. Um, PicMonkey, or I'm sorry, Canva has some layouts specifically for social media. And they have great backgrounds and, you know, the text laid out in different types of fonts, different sizes that incorporate really, really well and then can be shared on Pinterest. But once again, I don't recommend um, creating creating those quotes and then sharing them from those platforms or even just pinning the quotes. I, I encourage people to brand them at least to let people know where they quote came from. And in the pin description, you know, give people an invitation, you know, for more stuff like this, come on back to my website, you know, or to learn about that or, or whatever it is. Um, because if not, the quote will, will get shared across Pinterest, but people typically don't tend to click on quotes because they've gotten everything they've needed out of that image. Yeah, that's really good advice because you do need to download them. Otherwise, you're going to get branding from these different uh, sites on your actual pins and images. So in terms of your course, your online course, do you plan to scale up and create a fully online course to reach the masses? Um, it's going to get a little bit bigger, but it's never going to be I, at this point, the, the course that I have now going to be just, a, you know, an on demand type of video course. I really like to get to know who I'm working with and who I'm helping and, and who's purchasing this course. I want to make sure it's everything that they need it to be. And to do that for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people at a time isn't the way I want to, to build my business. Um, there's another course that I'm in the process of creating, which is more just about images, which is going to be more of that beginner, how do I create images, what works on Pinterest and other social networks that will be more of that video course. You also have a course on lynda.com. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that just launched about, oh, oh gosh, just a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Gosh, time is flying. Um, I did that for them. And it's it's the very beginning basics kind of intro to Pinterest for business course. Um, so if you're brand new, haven't really yet developed your strategy yet, haven't figured out how to develop a Pinterest strategy, or what that even, you know, the process for that, that's a good place to start with that. That's great. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few uh, questions about Pinterest. And this is for people that are not that savvy on Pinterest. I see a lot of these questions online. And maybe you can tell us what the difference is between a pin, a repin and a favorite. Sure. Um, well, a pin is a a, a image on any of your boards. Um, and it can c get there in a couple of different ways. You can pin it from some place you find online. So if I go to your podcast and you have a, you know, show notes and, you know, there's an image in your show notes, I can pin it from your show notes to my Pinterest account. Um, but then if somebody is following me on Pinterest or searches, you know, for some of the keywords that I used in the pins description and they come across that image, then they can repin it from my account to their account and all of their followers would see it, but it still links back 
to the show notes that I originally pinned it from. So there's a pin and there's a repin and a favorite um, in, in Pinterest. It's the shape of just this little heart that you can click on. And all that does is add that pin to a chronological list of things that you have liked in that way or favorited in that way. It doesn't go to a specific board. We're both podcasters and uh, I have a podcasting community on Facebook as well. And one of the questions they're going to be asking me, how do I get followers as a podcaster? Yeah, um, you're producing content, whether that content is visual or audio uh, or in text, um, you're producing content. And no matter what type it is, it has to have some sort of image. Um, and you have to create very pinnable images, images that the Pinterest community is going to resonate with. And sometimes people hear that and think, well, uh, you know, I don't know if I just want to focus on Pinterest. But when you create images like that, they're going to appeal to people across all the social networks. So it's you're not just limited to using this image on Pinterest. And it's not just going to appeal to people there. Um, so you will get, you know, kind of a good bang for your buck there as, as, you know, as far as investing your time and resources to create those images. Um, and you're going to want to make sure you create an account that's full of keywords, um, boards with keywords for your business or for your podcast, um, boards that are relevant, titled with topics that are relevant to your podcast and that people will be searching for. Because Pinterest is more of a search tool, uh, search and discovery tool, I guess, than it is a social network. People go to Pinterest to search for things. Um, you don't necessarily do that on Twitter and Facebook unless you're really into Twitter and Facebook and using it in that way, but the average user doesn't do that. Um, so really keywords are, are key and they're so important. Any place that you can use text on Pinterest, use them. And then if you are a podcaster and already active on other social networks, let people know that you have your account there. Um, if they're following you on one, tell them why they should follow you on Pinterest and you know you might get some new followers that way. Is there a particular WordPress plugin that you recommend for sharing on Pinterest? Well, you know, it really depends on your your website and your social sharing button preferences. I know there's lots of tools um, that come with themes. There's tools, you know, third-party tools. I have just started to test uh, sumome.com, which is a new social sharing tool. Um, and there's a lot of things I like about it. It's not 100% perfect for Pinterest yet, but I think it's getting there. But there's um, it, it has some really great features. I've just been using it a few weeks. And since I've started using it, um, I've seen my social shares increase. I get this question a lot. Isn't Pinterest just for women? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's like saying air is just for women. Um, no, uh, Pinterest is for anybody that wants to, you know, get on there and, and organize and catalog things that are, um, you know, what they're interested in. The reason that has been said so much and is, I think, a, a perception of Pinterest is because the early adopters of Pinterest happen to be women of the Midwest. And they're hobbies or interests included cooking and crafting and fashion and hair and nails and, and more feminine, you know, types of, of topics. But that doesn't mean it's just for women. Uh, Pinterest just introduced something recently where if you have indicated your gender in your account, um, when you do a search for something, they will try to bring you things more relevant to what you're interested in or what you've shown an interest in in the past. Um, they're also kind of monitoring, well, not really monitoring, but you know how websites kind of, you know, follow what you're doing online, things you're searching for on the internet, things you're searching for on Pinterest. And we'll keep that, you know, I guess, in, you know, not really in mind, but really let that influence or show up when you log on to Pinterest. They want to bring you the things that you're interested in. And you can change those settings in your privacy settings if you don't want that to happen. But the the shift is definitely coming, you know, to where it's going to be a little bit more, a little bit more balanced in the type of content that you see. And I, I have already noticed that. And internationally, as Pinterest has, has starting to, to grow or has, since it's come around oh, in countries like the UK, for example, Pinterest is more about 50-50 as far as user base, half men, half women. Um, so it's it's not just for women. And, and even if it were, who cares? Women make the, the purchasing decisions in most homes. So I think that's okay. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> they do make the purchasing decisions. So guys, get onto Pinterest. <laughs> So our business is actually successful with Pinterest marketing. Do you have examples? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, there's, uh, we can even start down with a podcaster blogger type of example. Um, there was a gentleman that I met and he had an image that was just a simple image about a simple topic and it's been pinned and the topic was how to teach your kid to tie their shoes. 
Simple, basic stuff, information, but the parent that needs to teach their child how to tie their shoes, it can change their world, you know, especially come school time. He wrote this article a few years ago and every year around, you know, school starting up again, he gets a wave of traffic. And ever since that first wave of traffic, it never really subsided. Um, And he just shared it on Pinterest Um, and the Pinterest community loved it and kept on sharing it and sharing it and pinning it and pinning it. And it continues to drive traffic. And it wasn't, uh, you know, a a gorgeous, you know, photo shoot with a kid learning how to tie their shoes, you know, something ready for a magazine. It was, you know, something he created in one of his, his tools. I'm not sure which one he used to create it, but it wasn't anything really that huge. Um, there have been instances where bloggers have written about a product and because of the, the product being seen in one of their pins, it wasn't even the focus of the pin. Um, there's been businesses that have just completely started online businesses, you know, e-commerce types of businesses where they bought it from a local store because of all the Pinterest traffic they got, because of all the emails and phone calls they got. Hey, how can I get that? There's there's lots of examples. Um, you know, even for myself, everything that I write is, is shared on Pinterest. And like I said, it's it's the main refer or main source of, of social media traffic for me. It's interesting. I think I've seen that Pinterest with the the kid tying the, the shoelaces. <laughs> <laughs> you probably have. I mean, I haven't checked on it in a few months, but it was over 400,000 pins. So what was his business? Um, at that point, he was writing uh, just kind of a, a life hacks kind of blog, you know, just kind of efficient life skills, you know. Um, so that was just one of the topics he wrote about one year because he was going through it with his daughter. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the other things that we like to do and uh, being techies is check analytics, data metrics. Do these even exist on Pinterest? Oh, yes. Uh, Pinterest has their own analytics system um, that you can access if you have a business account and it'll show you um, what your most popular pins are for a certain time frame and clicks, which is really important. You know, I, I love getting repins, but what's more important to me is that people are clicking through and coming to my um, to my blog, to my website. So there's that. And then also I use Google Analytics. I think that's gives me uh, so much information, you know, that I wouldn't know otherwise. And it's, you know, it's not too hard to figure out. Uh, There's a third party tool that you can purchase called Tailwind, which gives you even different information from either of the other services. And it also lets you schedule your pins, which is very, very helpful. Yeah, that's good to know, because we want to keep track of those stats. So what's another way to show pins to my audience without linking to Pinterest? There are some tools or embed codes and so on, right, uh, that Pinterest provides? Yeah, well, that that still will link to Pinterest. But yeah, you can embed your entire account. You can embed particular boards or you can embed individual pins straight from your Pinterest account uh, onto your blog or to your website. That's another good way to attract new followers. It shows people what you're pinning. That's cool. So Pinterest also has a pin it button, a follow button, a profile widget and board widget. It looks like these can all be integrated with your website. And the best part is that uh, they have a detailed step-by-step guide on how to use all their social sharing buttons. They also have a goodies page. Uh, what's that? Is that icons, badges? Yeah, um, the, that can be found on there. So like for a lot of my images, I use the actual Pinterest logo. I use their their badge, um, depending on how the image is created. And they have some marketing guidelines of how you should incorporate those or how you should use them and shouldn't use them. So if you are thinking of using them, make sure you read those. Um, and it also gives you browser buttons so or kind of bookmarklet tools. So you can just drag those those buttons into your browser so where you're out, you know, on the internet searching or, or looking at things that are relevant to your community, you can then pin it from there straight into your boards and, and your followers will get that link to that useful piece of information that you found. So are there any rules to using Pinterest? Some big no-nos? Um, the biggest no-no is do not change the links of somebody else's pins. <laughs> this just <laughs> happened to me this last week and it's still a little fresh. It's still a little sore. Um, uh, it wasn't just me. Other people who write and talk about Pinterest had this happen to their images as well. So, you know, we, we created the images for our articles for, you know, my show notes in some cases. And some guy thought it would be a good idea to create a whole board full of pins about, you know, Pinterest and then change the link to link back to his scammy spammy crazy youtube video yeah it was it was it was not a pleasant day and uh pretty much all you can do is you know report the account as spam record 
you know, report the, the individual PIN is spam and then submit a complaint um, or kind of a, a notice to Pinterest saying that, you know, there's some copyright infringement going on here. Wow. So that's the biggest no-no. And you'd have to be, you know, I mean, you know you're doing something wrong when you do that. But general etiquette things, um, you don't want to go to somebody's board and repin every single one of their pins to create your own board. Um, you know, so if they have 100 pins, you take all 100 pins and create your own board. It's like, well, that's just kind of copying. Um, you want to create your own board for your own community in the way that really represents you and what you're trying to, you know, bring to them. So if you take, you know, if you repin a few pins from somebody in a day, that's great. But taking every single one and just copying their board, that's that's not so great. Um, you also don't want to flood your own community and your own followers with lots of pins on the same topic at the same time. Um, this isn't quite so much a problem because Pinterest has implemented some Something called smart feed um, and they will filter what people are seeing in their feed so if let's say you have an interest in mountain climbing and you're researching a, a mountain climbing trip or that's what your business is about you can go to Pinterest and you know pin 25 articles in mountain about my, mountain climbing or supplies or things in a row that would potentially flood your followers Pinterest feed with those types of pins. Um, so it's not something you want to do for a couple of reasons for that reason. And then also you're only catching the people on Pinterest at that one time. And it's really a better technique to, to spread it around and, and, you know, maybe pin a few now, a few later, and then, you know, some even beyond that. There is a couple of questions, actually. When you repin somebody else's pin on your board, you're able to change the link that is, that's attached to it? You can change the link to any pin that you have on your account. Wow. Yeah, there should be some kind of, I think um, there should be some kind of way to prevent that from happening. Maybe that's something Pinterest should be looking into. I would think so. I'm really not sure why they've left it so open that way. I think, you know, I mean, if you've got it from a source, it should stay back to that source and not necessarily change to another source. Um, I'm just, I know that they've one way to really use that is if you create, let's say, um, an infographic like we were talking before, and those could be really, really big. And we may not have the room or the space to to put them on our blogs, you know, in full size. So what you can do is upload the image separately and then link that back to, you know, the blog post or the article or wherever you want it to go to. That's, you know, a legitimate good way to use it. Another way to use that kind of feature is if I'm at an event and I take a few pictures and I want people to know maybe the behind of behind the scenes of what I do. You know, if you're a photo photographer, you show, you know, you take pictures of yourself on a photo shoot, but that maybe isn't what you want on your website, you know, in that way. You can create a Pinterest board about that specific event or, you know, the behind the scenes board and upload those images and then link them back to your general website. So there are good ways to use it, but changing the links that way, yeah, there's, there, there should be, and I hope there is someday something that prevents that kind of thing from happening. Yeah, there should be. I think it really would protect the original owner off that particular pin. Mm -hmm. So in terms of scheduling, and you mentioned not to flood your followers with lots of pins at the same time, do you use a scheduling tool to post to Pinterest? Uh, Tailwind is what I use. There's a couple of others, but Tailwind um, is one of the few tools available out there that is actually, I don't want to say Pinterest approved, but they do have access to the Pinterest API, which it's not open, um, you know, as far as I understand how their their relationship or agreement works. There's another one called Curalate. Um, that's more for enterprise level type big, big businesses to use. Um, there's another one called uh, Viral Tag, but I don't think it has... I, that same kind of communication or relationship with Pinterest. So I've heard, you know, some good things, some, you know, okay things, uh, but the one I use is Tailwind. Yeah, that's an area I think that uh, companies have a potential uh, market for, and there should be more tools there. So how technically inclined does someone need to be to use your training? Um, not very. Um, I, I try to make things as easy and as straightforward as possible. I try to make sure that, you know, people's questions are answered along the way and that the process, I, you know, to, to get onto the training is as simple as possibly can be. So let's assume I'm one of your new students and I've just purchased your oh so interesting training. What would you recommend as my first step to getting the most out of your training? Um, with the way it's currently run, um, it's just to show up live to that first session and come willing to ask questions, to get involved. I like to make them very interactive and very fun. Um, I, you know, the best courses that I ever took in college were the the ones where the professors just didn't get up there and lecture. Is the ones where we talked and we had conversations. So really be there, prepared to be a part of the conversation. I also see my course as a, a networking opportunity 
and a place to meet new people and learn from each other. It's not just the lecture. Um, so I think come with an open mind, come ready to have fun and, and learn how to, you know, use Pinterest. And come with lots of questions. Yes, <laughs> if you have them. And then sometimes I know coming to something new, you don't even know what to ask. But as, you know, we progress through the course, don't be afraid to, to you know, ask. You know, if it, it stirs up something else or maybe it isn't even a topic that was, you know, planned on on, we co- on covering in that session. Maybe it was going to come later. I, I still welcome those questions because when you have that question, you, you kind of need it answered for yourself. And I'm sure other people probably have it too. So go ahead and ask away. So my listeners are people who are either just starting to create their first online course or trying to figure out ways to improve their existing online course. And some of these questions are meant to help answer their questions. What was the biggest mistake you made when you first started creating your online training? Uh, The first mistake I made was just waiting too long to do that. Um, I had a lot of hesitation. Oh, well, it's going to be too difficult about the payments. And what about, you know, what, when do I have it? How do I do it? I just, I just kind of blocked myself with questions. And then I listened to, I think, an interview with Noah Kagan of AppSumo and his approach is just get out there and do it. Just do it. And if it doesn't work, oh, well, it didn't work. Give them their money back, you know, whatever. And it's like, yeah, I could do that, you know. Uh, and that's what really started the very first one. And that was um, a little over a year ago when I first did that. And since then, it just it got easier and easier as I went along. I think we're all guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your workflow like when you created your course? How did you determine what to include, what not to include? And did you plan everything in minute detail? What was the training based on? Was it based on your personal experiences with Pinterest? Um, it was based on what I had worked with with clients, what seemed to be the most commonly asked questions when it came to Pinterest, where people were getting stuck. Um, and then also, I knew where businesses were maybe lacking in what they were doing or maybe some of the approach to Pinterest. You know, if, if you're not in there all the time, there's no way you're going to know these things. Pinterest is my business. If you're, a, you know, somebody interested in, in teaching people how to podcast, you need to know about podcasting, not about using Pinterest. That's my job. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I, I brought out those details and, and just made long lists of things that I thought should be incorporated where, you know, and then kind of broke them down into chunks and then created presentations based around that in tutorials. And now we have workbooks and, and all sorts of things that can go with it. So it, it was it was a process. And how long did it take you to create your oh so interesting training from initial idea to first client? I, I kind of had been kicking around the idea for a long time. And then I, you know, I said, okay, by this date, I want to run my first workshop. And it was probably about a month ahead. Um, so I created the outline of the workshop. I started creating the slides and everything I wanted to do that for. And about two, three weeks before I actually had the workshop you know, go live where the first class was going to be. I started promoting it and the first one sold out within just a few days. Nice. And what platform are you using to host and deliver your training and why? I've used a couple of different platforms. I've used uh, WebEx and I've used GoToMeeting. Um, And the last one I used, uh, last few I've done have been on GoToMeeting. Um, I really liked their, their, um, the way that they record their sessions because I do offer the videos for the people who participate in my workshop. I know sometimes, you know, life happens, schedules change and you can't be there for every session. And there's a lot of stuff we want, we cover. So if you want to go back and review something, um, I do, uh, the people who take my workshop do get the videos. Um, And, go to meeting made that process uh, really easy. So when when you say students receive or can view the training videos after the actual training, are these online somewhere? Are these recordings of the actual sessions, the live sessions? Yeah, they're recordings of the actual sessions. Yeah. So if you took the workshop, let's say last last fall, um, your recording is going to be different than the people who took it in the spring because different questions came up, different people had different, you know, situations. Um, so you'll get the one that goes with your session. And how do you protect your training videos and materials? Are they behind a membership platform? And if so, which one? Uh, yeah, they're just, I have a membership plugin for my um, blog right now. I'm in the process of changing everything over to Optimize Press. Um, but right now I just have a plugin that goes with the the blog theme that I was using. And it's it's a membership plugin from uh, the developer is called Pippin's Plugins. Uh, I don't remember the name of the actual tool, though. 
Nice name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that part was very memorable. But the membership plugin itself, he he offers quite a few different ones, um, and he's got one that's just for memberships. And it was it was really easy to use and really easy to make my existing blog into a membership site. That's awesome. So where are you hosting the videos for your course on your website, Vimeo, YouTube? Uh, they're on Vimeo. And why did you pick Vimeo? Uh, because the 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 program or the the service that they offered when I signed up for it, gosh, you know, when I first had this first course, you know, over a year ago, um, I checked them, I checked Wistia, I didn't really YouTube as much as I like YouTube, I didn't, I really wanted to protect them a little bit more and customize them more and um, not have that YouTube logo, <laughs> you know, at the bottom of the video. Um, so I went with Vimeo. Yeah, I've had a few guests that uh, are actually using uh, YouTube in an un unlisted playlist. So they don't show up anywhere, but you still do have to make sure you remove the other videos at the end of the, the video that's played, and you need some tools to do that. Uh, certain plugins let you do that. So what payment system did you end up using and why? I went with PayPal because it was the easiest to set up, um, the easiest to integrate with my bank. Um, I didn't have to get a separate merchant account or anything like that. So PayPal was just the easiest route for me to go. And how do you market your course? What's been most successful? Your podcast, Pinterest, other social media, blog? blog posts, webinars, or something else? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think long term and, and overall bang for my buck has been has been the podcast just because it, it's, you know, it's the podcast I did a year ago is still on iTunes and people are still listening to it. Um, people get to know me, they get to know my voice. So they, they know how and, you know, how I approach Pinterest, what I think about it, my philosophy behind it. And I think you can get all, that a lot more through a podcast than you can through a blog post. Um, and, and webinars and videos are great, and I do use those. Uh, but I know I'm busy, and for me to sit down for a 30-minute webinar is a lot more difficult for me to do than to – you know, have a 30 minute podcast and listen to it while I'm doing other things. And what's the name of your podcast? Tell us a little bit more about it. It's the Oh So Pinteresting Podcast. <laughs> 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 Got to keep that branding consistent. Um, yeah, I'm a, actually, I'm about to upload episode 83 today. Um, it's, it's a combination of interview episodes with just solo episodes with me just talking about topics of Pinterest, how to do stuff on Pinterest, but it's all about how to use Pinterest for marketing. So is that for beginners or intermediates or advanced uh, users? It covers everybody. Um, it just depends on which episode. Excellent. So looking back, what was the one tool, software or hardware that you absolutely needed to create your online training? I mean, I guess I couldn't have done it. I mean, WordPress, you know, because I needed someplace to put it. Uh, <laughs> um, and then beyond that, I really, uh, I got into to using Keynote. I use, I have a Mac and I, you know, I have both Photoshop and Keynote. And I just found Keynote to be much more flexible and um, helped me to get some really good slides created with, you know, I, of course, I wanted it to be visually interesting as well. We are talking about Pinterest. Um, so to incorporate some great images and, and things like that. And I've also needed ScreenFlow um, as, uh, initially before I started using uh, go to meeting. I use ScreenFlow to record the sessions, and then that was that was a little clunky. It didn't really go as well as it does when um, the Go to Meeting app. You know, I, when I started using that, but in the beginning, it was definitely ScreenFlow. Great. How do you support your students after they've taken your training? Do you use a special support group or forum online? Well, they have access to me via email. Um, everybody's situation is different. Some people just are a little bit shy and, you know, don't want to ask their questions during the sessions or whatever. So they have access to me via email for a certain amount of time, even after the course is over. I know there's people who have purchased my course and, you know, life got in the way, their business has changed and they weren't able to do it at that session. So, um, you know, they maybe were a couple of weeks behind or something. Um, and then beyond that, there is a private Facebook group that every person who takes my course has access to. So that community continues to grow and grow and grow as I have more sessions. Um, and we're always in there sharing ideas and, you know, sharing our wins. For example, one of the people who took my course changed something with her images, um, created a specific type of image, joined, a, you know, a group board, which was one of the strategies we talked about. And since then, you know, one day got 100 repins of her pins where before she was lucky if she was getting a few. That's great. Having a, an online support forum is really good where p students can interact with each other and help each other. That's awesome. So Cynthia, take a few minutes and offer your best, most practical advice to anyone thinking of creating their first online course or training. Um, the best one is, is to just sit down, write it out and sell it. 
<laughs> just just get in there and do it. I I don't think if I'd had a, taken Noah Kagan's advice, it was just a video I watched one time. I think it was like maybe a 10 minute video or something of where he was speaking somewhere and just, just got out there and do it. I'd still be trying to make it perfect. I'd still try to find the perfect tool, the perfect platform. It's going to change. Uh, there's so much that has changed with my course and it's about to go undergo another major shift that you know, if I didn't start, I'd still be trying to figure out the perfect thing. So just get, just, just do it. Just start it because it's going to change anyway. Cynthia, we have come to the end of the show. I could ask you a ton more questions about Pinterest and your online training, so aptly named, oh, so Pinteresting. But instead, I'm going to leave a link to it in the show notes so people can visit your website and check it out for themselves. Thank you very much for being such an amazing guest on the show and for sharing such valuable insights and advice. It has been a real pleasure speaking with you. Where can people connect with you online? I bet you'll never guess. <laughs> it ha- it's ohsopinteresting.com. Thanks for listening to Education Hackers. Check out the show notes and click the Love It button at educationhackers.com to send us some iTunes love. Until next time. Mm-hmm.